Hi, my name is Matt Yerglin. I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to present today. Um, I'm the director of the Lynch Syndrome Center at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, and I'll be talking about what's new in Lynch Syndrome these days. So here are my disclosures. So just as a brief outline for the talk, I want to talk a little bit about what's new in Lynch Syndrome diagnosis and risk assessment. Um, talk about what's new when it comes to actual, actually screening for Lynch syndrome related cancers um, as a close parallel, what's new in Lynch syndrome prevention, um, and then some exciting new data on how uh, we are learning how to treat Lynch syndrome cancers better and better with newer agents. So just to give uh, some basics, um, I assume this is information that, that's uh, familiar to a lot of the audience. Lynch syndrome is what we call an autosomal dominant uh, hereditary cancer predisposition syndrome um, that confers increased risk of a, a wide variety of cancers. It, it's quite common. It, it was previously thought of as being relatively rare, but that's not correct. We think it, correct, it accounts for about 3% of all colorectal cancers, about 2% of all uterine or endometrial cancers. Um, and data have suggested that the, the prevalence, if you just tested people off the street in the general population, would be about 1 in 279. Um, we define Lynch syndrome nowadays by the presence of a pathogenic germline variant, or what some people refer to as a mutation, in one of the DNA mismatch repair genes, the genes listed there, or in the EPCAM gene. Um, it, in spite of the fact that we call it all Lynch syndrome, it really is five different syndromes. Um, and these are pieces that, that are coming more and more into focus. MLH1 is one of the more classic forms of Lynch syndrome. We consider it high penetrance, meaning that there's a high lifetime risk of any cancer. Um, particularly with MLH1, we've learned that there's a high lifetime risk of GI tract cancers. So high risks of colorectal cancer, and then collectively various upper GI tract cancers as well, stomach, pancreas, bile duct, small intestine, um, MLH1 more so than the other genes has a particular uh, predilection for the GI tract. MSH2 is probably the other classic form of Lynch syndrome, also high penetrance, meaning there's a high lifetime risk of really any Lynch-associated cancer, um, including GI tract cancers like MLH1. But one thing that's particular to MSH2 is high risks of urinary tract cancers, especially for males, for reasons we don't yet understand. Um, I would say that MSH2 seems to have the widest spectrum of Lynch syndrome cancer risk, encompassing the GI tract, the gynecologic tract, as I mentioned, the urinary tract, and then some other tumors that we actually don't see as often in other forms of Lynch syndrome, such as impacts on the skin, what we call sebaceous adenomas or sebaceous carcinomas of the skin, rarely things like sarcomas, adrenal cancers. Um, the, the spectrum, for whatever reason, seems to be particularly wide with MSH2. MSH6, on the other hand, um, has classically been thought of as being uh, more of a moderate risk form of Lynch syndrome. And that's not entirely true based on some recent data, where it, in the gynecologic tract, it seems like the risk is actually reasonably high, probably comparable to what we see with MLH1 and MSH2, with high lifetime risks of endometrial cancer and ovarian cancer. But where the risk is a little bit more attenuated or moderate would be in the GI tract for whatever reason with MSH6, where the lifetime risk of colorectal cancer is actually quite a bit lower with MSH6 than it is with MLH1 or MSH2. PMS2 is one where we're getting a lot of data all of a sudden. We, we used to consider this the rarest form of Lynch syndrome. Turns out it's not rare at all. It's actually the most common form of Lynch syndrome. We were just missing a lot of cases uh, in the old days. And part of the reason we were missing them is because PMS2 forms a particularly low penetrance form of Lynch syndrome. It's, it's still real. We take it seriously, but the risk of any Lynch cancer is far lower with PMS2 than it is with other forms of Lynch syndrome. And it may be that the spectrum of cancers that we see in PMS2 related Lynch syndrome is actually quite a bit narrower than it is with other forms of Lynch syndrome. And there may only be increased risks of colorectal and endometrial cancers, but perhaps no increased risk of some of these other cancers, including ovarian cancer, upper GI tract, urinary tract cancers. A lot of this is still coming into focus, but PMS2 is more and more being looked at as a bit of an outlier compared to other forms of Lynch syndrome. And then lastly, EPCAM is one where we still have pretty minimal data. This really is the rarest form of Lynch syndrome. We know that there's high lifetime risks of colorectal cancer. Um, germline alterations, inherited alterations in EPCAM tend to uh, or, uh, work by essentially silencing function of the MSH2 gene. And so we assume that this um, overlaps with what we see with MSH2-related Lynch syndrome, but we haven't actually proven that just yet. So this is still coming into focus.
And just to summarize some of what I, what I listed here, as far as some of the gene-to-gene differences, again, the risks are highest for MLH1 and MSH2. MSH2 seems to have the widest spectrum of risk. MSH6 still has high risks of gynecologic cancer, but less so in the GI tract. And then PMS2 um, may be having a very narrow uh, spectrum of risk compared to the other genes. And so we're, we're getting better and smarter about gene-specific risks in Lynch syndrome. Um, and now there's two calculators that are out there that are freely available for use that actually also incorporate in somebody's sex, their age, and th- these can be extremely useful in understanding, well, what is my risk of these specific cancers? If you factor in the gene in question, somebody's sex and their age, and really we're trying to get better and more personalized at how we uh, counsel people on what their risks of Lynch syndrome cancers are. Um, shifting gears now, how do we actually find Lynch syndrome in day-to-day practice? Um, this is a calculator that uh, my colleagues here at Dana-Farber developed a handful of years ago called the PREM calculator, specifically PREM5, because it predicts for likelihood of all five Lynch syndrome genes. It's so another free online tool. It takes only about a minute to complete, but basically you input um, an individual's age, their sex, and then their own history and their family history of Lynch-related cancers, and it will spit out a numeric likelihood of that person having Lynch syndrome. National guidelines nowadays recommend that somebody be tested for Lynch syndrome if their score is 2.5% or higher so that we catch the majority of people with Lynch syndrome. And this has been in national guidelines now for a few years. That said, the field has moved away from syndrome-specific genetic testing, as people may know. And nowadays, most genetic testing is done through what we call multi-gene panel testing, where people are tested for dozens of genes at a time, not just the five Lynch syndrome genes. Um, These data come from a study we did a handful of years ago looking at multi-gene panel testing in all comers with colorectal cancer, more than 1,000 individuals. And consistent with what we expected from the historic literature, about 3% of people have Lynch syndrome, but 7% of people had other forms of inherited cancer risk, including alterations in the BRCA genes, um, PALB2, TP53, and other genes that we wouldn't historically have thought to look for. So the question becomes, how do you identify people with non-Lynch syndrome forms of inherited cancer risk, or how do you use clinical prediction um, models nowadays that we're in the era of multi-gene panel testing? And so to account for that, we recently um, developed and validated, and just earlier this summer we published, um, the PREM Plus model, which is really de- uh, designed for multi-gene panel risk assessment. Who needs a multi-gene panel? Um, we looked at over 30,000 individuals who had had prior multi-gene panel testing. Um, what PREM Plus does is it essentially predicts for somebody's likelihood of having an inherited alteration, um, a so-called mutation, in one of 19 different genes, including 11 genes linked to high lifetime risks of uh, cancer and eight genes list- linked to more moderate risks of cancer. The 19 genes are, are listed here, and I highlighted the five Lynch genes. And how it does this Um, PREM Plus evaluates somebody's own history and their family history, including the ages of diagnosis, of 18 different types of cancer or uh, pre-malignant lesions, which I listed here, which um, includes most of the spectrum of Lynch-related cancers, as well as other forms of, uh, or other types of cancer that we historically will link to inherited cancer susceptibility, including breast cancer, desmoids, ovarian cancer, sarcomas, et cetera. And ultimately, what we showed as we developed and validated this is that it was 89 to 94% sensitive, meaning it would catch that number of cases um, for identifying people who harbored high penetrance forms of inherited cancer risk and what we call the negative predictive value, meaning the likelihood that it could successfully rule out somebody having one of these alterations was 97 to 98%. Um, We're looking forward to studying this further and wider, um, and we're working to develop an online portal to allow clinicians and hopefully um, patients themselves um, to input information so that people can use this in routine practice. And so, as I mentioned before, you know, the the Lynch syndrome um, management, because there's such a long list of cancers um, that we link to Lynch syndrome, in the old days, we were kind of taking what I call a throw the kitchen sink at it type of approach. Um, where, you know, we would basically screen everybody for everything. Um, And a lot of these uh, screening tests are things that don't have a ton of data behind them. Um, And so I think as we learn more about some of the gene to gene differences in people with Lynch syndrome, as well as other factors, age, sex, family history, I think we're able to get better and smarter and more sophisticated at personalizing a lot of these risk assessments. So, you know, this older approach, I think, is is falling by the wayside and we're getting better at personalized approaches, but we still have a ways to go.
I want to talk a little bit about aspirin in Lynch syndrome. Um, people who, who attended this conference last year heard uh, some of this, um, but aspirin is a piece that's relatively um, new over the past couple of years, as far as part of what I think should be the standard management for a lot of people with Lynch syndrome. We know from the cardiovascular literature that people who take regular aspirin tend to get colorectal cancer at lower rates than people who don't take aspirin. But if you look at this across just average risk individuals, it's actually just a small degree of preventative benefit. But a number of years ago, um, investigators uh, led by Professor Sir John Byrne from Newcastle University um, asked the key question, does aspirin have a larger preventative benefit in people where their baseline risk of colorectal cancer is higher, specifically people with Lynch syndrome? And so that's where the CAP2 study came in, um, which was a large multinational study looking at individuals from 43 different countries, individuals with, Lynch, with proven Lynch syndrome, although I'll point out that it only looked at MLH1, MSH2, and MSH6. This was a randomized uh, placebo-controlled clinical trial. Half the people on the study got daily aspirin, high dose, 600 milligrams a day. Half the people got a placebo. Um, and the first couple of publications from this um, showed the first publication showed no significant benefit with really short-term follow-up, but as longer and longer follow-up was performed, uh, the benefits became more obvious. We saw that people who with Lynch syndrome who took aspirin for at least two years had about 40 to 50% fewer colorectal cancers than the people taking placebo. And because these were all people who had known Lynch syndrome, the preventative benefit really seems to be on top of um, the benefits that they get from colonoscopies. It's important to point out from these data that um, it's a very delayed benefit. Really, there was no significant difference in colorectal cancer rates seen for the first five years or so. Um, but even taking just the aspirin for two years, as was done in this study, the, the benefit persisted years and years and actually really a couple of decades on from when people first enrolled in this study, what we call a legacy effect. Um, and so nowadays, I would say for people who don't have an obvious reason why they can't take aspirin, um, this really should be a strong consideration for most people with Lynch syndrome. Um, it's worth pointing out that there was no significant difference in um, rates of other Lynch syndrome cancers. They saw maybe a bit of a signal that maybe the uterine cancer rates were a little bit lower, but this wasn't what we called st statistically significant. And I think one of the big rubs of this study was the fact that the aspirin dose was so high. I think a lot of people are understandably reluctant to use a, the 600 milligram a day dose. There is a follow-up study going on right now called the CAP3 study, which is examining different doses. We're not expecting to have results on that for another couple of years, but stay tuned. My current approach for, for Lynch syndrome, I tend to take a bit of a risk stratified approach. I, I'll use higher doses of aspirin for people who have higher future colorectal cancer risks based on their gene, based on their age, and just based on how much large bowel they have left in place. Um, in many cases, all of that large bowel. Um, and for people who have, you know, really lower future risks of colorectal cancer, maybe because they're older and they have just fewer years at risk if they have PMS2 associated Lynch syndrome, if they have only a small amount of remaining large intestine, I'll use lower doses or in some cases, no aspirin. And certainly no aspirin for people who have significant risks of complications. We also typically avoid this during the early trimesters of pregnancy unless otherwise advised by somebody's obstetrician. But one piece that's historically been lost in the shuffle with the CAP2 study is there was actually a second intervention here. In addition to the aspirin randomization, everybody on this study was also randomized to take daily resistant starch, which was basically a white powder in a packet, um, versus a placebo, which was just a dummy powder in that packet. And part of the reason it's fallen by the wayside is because there was essentially no difference seen. This is the long-term follow-up, the 20-year follow-up um, as far as colorectal cancer rates go. Um, and the, the placebo is in blue, the resistant starch in orange here. And essentially there was no significant difference between uh, the two arms as far as the, the rates of new colorectal cancer. That said, newer data have suggest, uh, or newer information from this study actually showed a pretty powerful and a pretty impressive reduced rate of other cancers in Lynch syndrome carriers who are taking the resistant starch. Um, so this graph here shows the, the likelihood of getting a new non-colorectal cancer. Um, the orange is the individuals taking the resistant starch, the blue is the placebo. The rate was, um, was not even half as high in the people taking resistant starch of these extra colonic cancers. And in fact, the, the, the difference was seen most profoundly in upper GI tract cancers. There were only five upper GI tract cancers. So 
pooling together stomach cancer, pancreatic, bile duct, and small intestine cancer. There are only five such cancers in the group taking the resistant starch, whereas there were 21 in the people taking the placebo. We don't totally know what the mechanism for this is, but the investigators have speculated that this is related to changes in what we call the microbiome, the the bacteria that normally and naturally live in somebody's gut. Um, And I think a lot of people understandably look at this and say, well, how do I take resistant starch? Well, it turns out that the amount of resistant starch that they looked at in this study was the equivalent of taking of eating one green banana a day, or at least greenish banana a day. As as the banana gets riper and riper, um, the resistant starch kind of disappears. Um, But so for lynch carriers looking to um, try to achieve some of the same benefits here, it's pretty reasonable to to eat a green banana a day or a greenish banana a day um, and hopefully get the same benefit. All right, shifting gears now, I want to talk a little bit about pancreatic cancer, which is one of the Lynch cancers where we've historically just had a difficult time knowing what to recommend for people. Um, It's it's a cancer that's gotten understandably bad reputation. Um, And recent data have suggested that there really is more of an inherited component to pancreatic cancer than we've historically given it credit for. Up to 10% of individuals um, with pancreatic cancer um, will have some sort of inherited alteration that seemed to predispose them to it, including Lynch syndrome. And nowadays, national guidelines recommend genetic testing for everybody diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, regardless of their family history, regardless of their age. Um, This is a list of some of the genes linked to pancreatic cancer risk. I'll come back to the slide in, in a couple of slides here. Um, but what we've seen is we've looked across various studies, the, the bars in blue all the way to the left would be the likelihood of having Lynch syndrome if you have pancreatic cancer. And it's a 1%, 2% of cases or so, depending on the study that you look at, that's not a trivial percentage. Um, if you look at all the genes and all the syndromes combined, it's at least 10% and, and perhaps even higher depending on the population. Um, and that's really led to the idea that everybody should be getting genetic testing, but pancreatic cancer is a cancer where we've historically had a hard time getting patients and their family members in for, for genetic testing, partly because it's, it's such a bad cancer. Um, and so it, to help address this, um, our group recently led a study look, um, looking at what we call cascade testing for individuals um, with pancreatic cancer in their family. This was a study called the Generate study, where we were looking to test not just the individual, not the individuals with pancreatic cancer themselves, but their at-risk family members. Um, and specifically looking at two new strategies for providing uh, genetic care. This was started before the COVID era, but basically people and families who signed up for this were randomized to participate in a session with a genetic counselor through an interactive web-based platform, kind of like Zoom, um, or um, to receive just a, just an online pre-recorded video and then to have the testing mailed to them, kind of the equivalent of more or less direct-to-consumer genetic testing. And where we're looking at the uptake of genetic testing across those two study arms. Um, So what we found was that the uptake of genetic testing was particularly high in both arms, Um, 87% in the um, interactive uh, session with the genetic counselor arm, and actually 93% of individuals who signed up who did the more direct-to-consumer type of genetic testing um, completed genetic testing. So the uptake was high in both arms, but actually higher in the people who did the more streamlined approach. We enrolled people remotely, and again, this started before the COVID era, and so this was, it ended up being coincidentally something that um, fit nicely into the telemedicine era. Now, um, this is just a heat map from uh, participants around the country who participated, and then highlighting the different investigative sites that that led this, where where some of the um, recruitment was focused. Um, But you can see we we had uptake from uh, more or less across the country. Um, We unfortunately had particularly poor participants. the study was made up mostly of individuals of non-Hispanic white backgrounds. Um, And so it points to the need to look at novel approaches to deliver genetic care for individuals and families um, of other socioeconomic, racial, ethnic um, backgrounds. In spite of the geographic diversity, um, we we did not have very good uh, racial and ethnic diversity. Um, So as we saw high uptake of genetic testing Um, This uh, provided some fuel to the fire to say that this is a viable approach to provide uh, genetic care. And in fact, it showed us that um, the uptake was higher for those who didn't do the interactive session, meaning that for the people who at least want 
to have easy, simple access to genetic testing, um, the more streamlined we make it, the better. But we need to figure out better how to reach um, historically marginalized populations. Um, and so my colleagues, uh, Dr. Rodriguez and Dr. Single, are currently leading the REGENERATE study, which is looking how to do this in racially and ethnically diverse populations um, so that we can do a better job delivering this genetic care to families that may be at risk for Lynch syndrome or other forms of inherited pancreatic cancer risk. And while I'm on the topic of pancreatic cancer, um, pancreatic cancer surveillance is an area where there have been recent advances. This is an, an intentionally dense slide. I highlighted here um, some of the fine print language from our national guidelines that we use on pancreatic cancer screening, which essentially says that um, we've seen some hints of benefit to pancreatic cancer screening, but we need longer term outcomes to figure out if we're actually moving the needle at all by, by aggressive surveillance for people um, with inherited risk factors to pancreatic cancer and pointing out that there's da potential downside to, to aggressive pancreatic cancer screening, especially since we find so many, if you want to call them false positives when we screen people. So this is where um, I'll come back to what the risks look like in Lynch syndrome. Um, we're these risks are still coming into focus. For MLH1, MSH2, and MSH6, there does seem to be a significantly increased risk for pancreatic cancer, but the studies have been a little bit all over the place as far as what those risks look like. The middle column suggests that it's a six to seven fold increased risk compared to the general population. Other studies though have shown that if you if you accumulate that risk over time, that the statistics are actually pretty, pretty modest as far as what those risks look like. And we're not sure if this actually applies to PMS2 and to EPCAM. But we now have a growing amount of data about how to screen for pancreatic cancer and what that does. So these are data from the CAPS consortium, um, which is a multi-site uh, study consortium across the United States. Um, these data came out earlier this year, looking at more than 1,700 individuals who either had striking family histories of pancreatic cancer or had a known genetic risk factor such as Lynch syndrome plus a family history. Although I'll point out only about 4% of these people actually had Lynch syndrome. So this included a lot of people with BRCA alterations and otherwise. They found, first of all, that you didn't need to screen that many people to find pancreatic cancer. They found one cancer per year for every 194 people screened. That's actually a lot. Um, more than I think we would have expected. And what was particularly striking here is that screen detected pancreatic cancers. In other words, people who had no symptoms when a pancreatic cancer was found, these were disproportionately early stage, stage mostly stage one, some stage two. And impressively, the survival was quite good here. 73% were alive five years after their pancreatic cancer diagnosis. Contrast that to historical rates, which are really more like 11% or so. And then contrast that to people who were lost to follow up. They enrolled in the study, but then didn't follow through. Those who were diagnosed with pancreatic cancer were almost all diagnosed at stage four. None of them were alive five years later. And this is unfortunately more what we expect to see with pancreatic cancer um, in the absence of screening. Um, so this just shows it visually, um, the pie chart on the left being those uh, that are screen detected versus the pie chart on the right being those who were lost to follow up. Uh, almost all were stage one or stage two in those that were screen detected and almost all were advanced stage in, in those that were not. Um, some cautions about pancreatic cancer surveillance still, um, 30 to 40% of people who get screened will have some degree of lesion in the pancreas, most commonly small cysts. Most of these don't require biopsy or other intervention, but it's important to emphasize this up front because it's an inherently charged thing to tell somebody with risks of pancreatic cancer that, you know, hey, we found some stuff in your pancreas, but we're just going to watch them. We are understanding what some more worrisome findings are in pancreatic cancer surveillance when we do MRIs and endoscopic ultrasounds, but I would emphasize that it's really important that this surveillance be done with clinicians, radiologists, endoscopists who are experienced with interpreting these nuances. This is very nuanced screening, and it really should be done under the care of people who have a lot of experience doing this. So nowadays, we do recommend this type of surveillance with MRIs and endoscopic ultrasounds at least yearly for people with various forms of inherited pancreatic cancer risk, including Lynch syndrome, if there's also a family history of pancreatic cancer. I think the big unknown now is whether we should also be screening those without a family history. Um, and there's a lot of efforts looking to, to answer this question. We usually start that surveillance at age 50 or 10 years younger than the youngest pancreatic cancer in the family. Um, and again, as I mentioned, this really ideally should be done at a center and with clinicians who have expertise in doing this surveillance. There's so many nuances to interpreting these results and, and guiding people on how to move forward.
say a quick word about a couple of other forms of cancer surveillance and Lynch syndrome where we're getting new data, data that have just come out in the past year. Um, the, this was a large study looking at prostate cancer surveillance in males with Lynch syndrome, over 800 individuals. Um, again, limited to MLH1, MSH2, and MSH6, and starting at age 40, with just a simple annual PSA blood test. Um, they did detect 4%, 4 plus percent of MSH2 carriers and 3% of MSH6 carriers with prostate cancer detected by PSA. Interestingly, none with MLH1. Um, and this has really reinforced at least my own practice to begin that screening at age 40 for men with Lynch syndrome, whereas in the general population, we usually start at age 50. Um, we still have work to do to, to figure out if the screening is actually uh, preventing death from, from prostate cancer, um, but we are seeing what looks like a real link between Lynch syndrome and prostate cancer. Urinary tract cancer, I mentioned before that this is something we see disproportionately in MSH2-associated Lynch syndrome. We've never known really what to do with this or how to screen. This was a study that came out um, from our colleagues in Ohio um, earlier this year where they looked at over 200 individuals, no symptoms, but they all had Lynch syndrome, where they did just a, a what we call a, a urinalysis, just essentially a dipstick to look for microscopic blood in the urine. They found that over 9% of these individuals did have microscopic blood. They're all referred for what's called a cystoscopy, which you can think of as being more or less kind of a colonoscopy for your bladder. Um, all of them were normal in spite of having microscopic blood on, um, on their urinalysis. But what was disconcerting is that five individuals actually were then diagnosed with urinary tract cancer after presenting with, uh, after presenting with symptoms, and in spite of the regardless of what their urinalysis showed. So the urinalysis showed plenty of false positives and actually some false negatives here kind of showing it to be pretty useless, unfortunately. Um, so we don't totally know uh, what the best means for screening for urinary tract cancer is in Lynch syndrome, but urinalysis doesn't seem to be it, unfortunately. Where there is some promise is this uh, preliminary study that was looking at a new assay developed by um, our colleagues uh, from the United Kingdom, looking at cell-free DNA in the urine, specifically cell-free DNA for what we call microsatellite instability. Microsatellite instability is a molecular phenomenon that we expect to see in basically all Lynch cancers. So they looked specifically at people who had known urinary tract cancer, um, and they were able to detect microsatellite instability from just a urine specimen and then impressively and importantly, after that person had surgery to remove their cancer, the cell-free DNA um, showing microsatellite instability could no longer be detected in the urine. So this is exciting. It hasn't yet been studied in asymptomatic surveillance, but I think assays such as this are really our, our next step forward, hopefully. And some really exciting stuff when it comes to treating Lynch syndrome cancers. This study made a whole lot of headlines back in June, and, and rightfully so. Um, they were looking at stage two or three rectal cancer. And just to give some context, most people with stage two and or three rectal cancer are treated with multimodality therapy. They get chemotherapy and radiation together. They get surgery and usually additional chemotherapy. And the sequence of, of these treatments is, is something that um, is sometimes a bit variable, but usually all three treatments are included. And these have high rates of long term term side effects or quality of life effects. Many people require permanent colostomies. Even people who don't often have long-term bowel dysfunction, urinary dysfunction, sexual dysfunction, neuropathy from the chemotherapy. And we know that MSI high rectal cancers, which is what you would expect to see in Lynch syndrome, they respond somewhat poorly to chemotherapy to begin with. And so what was exciting about this study is they looked at um, individuals with stage two or three rectal cancer that was MSI high, and they treated them with dostarlamab, which is what we call a PD-1 inhibitor, a form of immunotherapy. They treated them with dostarlamab as the first treatment before any chemo, radiation, surgery, et cetera, um, where the study design was to then go on and get these standard therapies in those who had an incomplete response. But the first 12 patients that they treated all had a complete response to the dostarlamab. 100%. They had no tumor left after the six months and are currently being managed without any of those other treatments. We're still awaiting long-term follow-up, but these are extremely exciting data. Um, these are just uh, some, uh, some figures from, from the paper, the, the top row being two separate patients, um, where at baseline, you can see these ugly looking cancers that at three and six months had completely disappeared, um, where I think people are hopeful that these people have been cured with the immunotherapy. We don't know that yet, but, but that's, um, th that's part of why this made such, such impressive headlines. Um, and then uh, just uh, earlier this fall, um, at the ESMO conference, um, 
they presented a similar study looking at people with early stage colon cancer that was MSI high, where they treated them with preoperative immunotherapy um, and then looked at what was found at the time of surgery. 95% of these individuals had a major response to the immunotherapy where there was very little cancer left at surgery. And actually two thirds of them had no cancer left at the time of surgery. 3% did have major side effects, um, but here's what we call the waterfall plot, which just kind of shows each uh, horizontal bar or vertical bar being an individual patient treated on this study. And if the bar goes all the way down to the bottom, it means there was no cancer left. And you can see that almost all of these individuals had complete or near complete response um, to this upfront immunotherapy, which, which is really exciting. Um, just to point out that there is another ongoing nationwide study right now looking at people who had upfront resection for a colon cancer that was MSI high, um, looking at chemotherapy versus chemotherapy plus immunotherapy. And for anybody with Lynch syndrome who develops a stage three colon cancer, this is a very exciting study. Um, it's expected to finish, uh, to complete its accrual, hopefully by the end of the calendar year here, but is still uh, currently open um, nationwide. And so lastly, I mentioned some of this last year, but wanted to talk for a minute on vaccines with, uh, for Lynch syndrome as, as a potential approach to immune-based prevention. Um, there have been some early phase studies. This is a, a, a paper from our colleagues in Germany um, who have worked on developing a, a vaccine, kind of leveraging some of the same biology as to um, the immunotherapy. If immunotherapy works well to treat these cancers, can we prevent these cancers with, with boosting the immune system? So they um, did a study looking at people who had had a prior colon cancer that was MSI high, um, vaccinated them against specific peptides, proteins that you would expect to see based on that microsatellite instability, showed significant immune responses, um, good safety profile, but these are all very preliminary data. Um, when you start looking at a similar type of vaccine in mice, um, who are biologically engineered to more or less have the mouse equivalent of Lynch syndrome, um, they saw that these mice with a vaccine had substantially improved survival when you gave them vaccination against cancers that could be MSI high. Interestingly, if you gave them anti-inflammatories like naproxen, um, the vaccines seemed to work better, um, suggesting that maybe the aspirin benefit that we see here since aspirin and naproxen are, are so closely related might, be more, might have something to do with potentiating the immune system. We're still um, figuring this out, but a lot of exciting developments. Um, and then as, as people in this audience may know, there are some ongoing small um, studies here in the United States right now looking at um, introducing these vaccines in the clinic um, for people with Lynch syndrome. We expect that these efforts are going to grow in size and scope and availability as, as things progress. And um, these early phase trials are looking at safety and what we call immunogenicity, just confirming that an immune response is actually generated. So stay tuned and hopefully in, in future years, I'll have uh, more to present on these uh, as our colleagues uh, continue to study this. And so just to summarize, we've got new tools for understanding personalized risk in Lynch syndrome, accounting for individuals' genes in particular, but also sex and age. And I think we're looking at other ways to try to personalize risk assessment and personalize risk management. Um, for individuals with Lynch syndrome, we have improvements in surveillance for pancreatic cancer and some exciting developments that might start moving the needle in urinary tract cancer. Um, we know that aspirin substantially reduces colorectal cancer rates in Lynch syndrome, and this resistant starch, a green banana a day, seems to have a powerful effect at reducing upper GI tract cancers in Lynch syndrome, and a lot of exciting developments in immune-based treatment and possibly even immune-based prevention. So the, the future is bright and exciting, um, and thanks so much for listening.